It's really good to be back at NG Vikings, actually, because I was here last year. I was actually here as an attendee last year, not as a speaker. And it's really interesting because, like, throughout the, throughout the year, every t- I've spoken at so many conferences throughout the year, and it's like we can just trace, a lot of us can just trace our connections back as speakers to this conference. So actually, I met Simona here. Well, I didn't actually meet Simona here. She was at this conference last year, and I remember a Simona shape, but we didn't actually know each other, but now we work together. So, um, so yeah, I just, I just wanted to say, I just wanted to give a, a shout out to the NG Vikings conference because I, I really like this one. Um, and yeah, before I begin the talk today, I'd just like to ask a quick question to the audience. Um, could you put your hands up if you've ever been so scared, so frightened in your life that a little bit of pee has come out? Yeah? Okay, put your hands up. Keep your hands up. Okay. Okay, you can put your hands down now. And that was about um, 83% of the audience. And hopefully today I will increase that number a little bit (laughs) because uh, today we're going to talk about web security and how to hack an Angular application. Um, And I'm going to talk to you uh, through a series of three different real-life hacking stories. Um, And maybe you'll learn something, but my goal isn't to teach you anything. My goal is to make you pee yourself. So, um, thank you for the introduction. My name is Asim Hussain, yes. You can find me on Twitter, at Jawache. I blog about JavaScript and Angular on my site, codecroft.tv. I also have a a free book on Angular, which you can grab. It's it's, it's a, a proud thing that I've done. And I'm also, I think I'm also a cloud developer advocate at Microsoft. So um, I work in the Azure team uh, with Simona and and we work for John. And um, our job is basically to be a conduit between the Azure team and yourself as developers. So if you've got anything you want to, if you've got anything good, maybe you use Azure and you you like it and you just want to say, you know, what a great job, come speak to me afterwards. I'd love to hear that. If you've also, if you've got anything that you don't like about Azure, if you tried it and you didn't like it, um, come speak to Simona. Okay. So, um, oh, also I teach on Udemy. So does anybody know Udemy? Yeah, a few people. So they recently added automatic captioning on Udemy. So they added it for your lectures. And, and, and actually, one of the things they did is they replaced my name with awesome. <laughs> so. Um, so hopefully, this, uh, this talk is going to be very asim. Um, but before we begin, I'd like to just, just to clear up a couple of terminology here, because we can all be, not everybody here is a security expert, right? So just a couple of different terms. So when I, what is a vulnerability versus an exploit? Okay? So a vulnerability is just a hole in your security. Okay, so not setting up a firewall is just a vulnerability. That's all it is. Um, an exploit is a script or a series of commands or even just like a manual series of steps which you run to take advantage of a vulnerability to do something bad. Okay, so vulnerability versus exploit. Just a bit of terminology there. Let's start off with the first story. Does anybody know this company? Hmm? Anyone? I still use Perforce, but whatever. People seem to like it. No, I don't. I use GitHub. So um, this is a story about uh, GitHub, a hack on GitHub. And in fact, GitHub has this thing called a bug bounty. So basically, they pay you if you find a security hole in their software, as long as you keep it a secret, you know, and you, you don't tell anybody, and you give them a chance to fix it, um, and then. They sometimes allow you to to write a report on it, and then they pay you a sum of money as well. So this is actually a a bug bounty, a bug that was found by somebody called Orange Sai. So this is not mine issue. I didn't find this stuff. This is Orange. Please follow Orange on Twitter. He's a really cool guy. He posts some some amazing, interesting stuff uh, on there. So follow him as well, but only after you follow me. And this is just a really great story of, of the bug they found on GitHub. And I love this story because it feels like a, a heist movie. I love heist movies. You know when they're trying to rob a bank and you're trying to figure out how they did it in the end. This is a really great story. I'd love to share it with you. 
So if you've used GitHub before, maybe you've used a feature in GitHub called webhooks. Okay? So you can basically do a git push, um, and then you can set up, so when you do a git push, it will then do a, uh, a post to a URL that you've specified. Okay? So pretty simple, right? But what if instead of example.com, what if you set up to use localhost? Okay? Then when you do a git push, you're doing a post request on the same server behind the firewall. And remember, you can have a URL can have a host and a port. So you basically can do a push, a post to any process running on any port on the same server that the Git is running on. Yeah? Okay, no, right? GitHub is a little bit more savvy than this. Um, this is something, it's a common issue with uh, security, which is untrusted input. So that local host, that URL, is something a user can enter, so it's untrusted input. And what do you do with untrusted input? You have to sanitize it. You have to make sure that the user isn't entering something which can be used uh, as an exploit, right? So they used a sanitizer, and that sanitizer blocked uh, local host, blacklisted local host, okay? But it forgot about zero. Okay, so zero on some, some machines can resolve to localhost. So now Orange has got a way in. Okay, now Orange can do a post, a HTTP post message to zero on any port. So now they can do a post to any process running on that server, behind the firewall, remember. <laughs> but what can you do with that, really, if you think about it? What can you do with that? Okay, you can do post, but what can you do with that? When searching through what's run on like a GitHub server, found that this process is running. And I love playing this game. We're going to play um, guess the port. So who can guess what process port 9200 is? Any guesses? Elasticsearch. Okay, so Elasticsearch is a search technology you use. So Elasticsearch um, is running on port 9200 and it has an endpoint called shutdown. And if you post, if you do a HTTP post to shut down, it shuts down Elasticsearch, which basically shuts down search in GitHub. So you can't search anymore. So now Orange has found a way in. Um, first exploit, which basically can shut down Elasticsearch. I think at best you can describe this as kind of maybe a style of denial of service attack. So you can maybe shut down search. Search stops working on GitHub, but not really the kind of um, Mr. Robot style hack that we're looking for here, right? It's just like a little bit annoying. So then Orange went away and thought, okay, let me now try and figure out what other uh, vulnerabilities and exploits that I can chain together on this one to do something a bit more interesting. Went hunting and hunting and hunting and found another process running on that server, a process called Graphite, which is basically a charting tool, okay? And it has, an, it has basically different endpoints that get called on different HTTP requests. And it has this endpoint that gets called send email. Or send email actually gets called on a HTTP post. It is Python. Okay? Don't panic. I'm going to take you through it. It's easy. So this, is, this gets called on a HTTP post. What, what it does, it gets from the query parameters, gets the URL and then basically still gets the path, the actual URL, and then just does a get request to that path. So from the query parameters, gets the URL, and takes the value of that, and then does a get request to that URL, okay? So basically, if this was your webhook that you put in, everything gets, all gets posted to 800, which is um, Graphite, the red thing, the red URL which you pass in, that then gets extracted, and that piece of code runs a GET request on that. But what have we done here, really? Okay, all that you've really done is converted a POST into a GET. Just a POST into a GET, okay? Not really a big thing, right? But it's another step. 
However, that piece of code was using a library called HTTP connection. And this has a known vulnerability okay, in older versions of, of, of Python. Not even that old, to be honest with you. And there's an issue called carriage return line feed injection. So um, new line on Windows is uh, carriage return, I'm a bullying, carriage return, backslash R. New line on everything else is backslash N. So a cross-platform way of doing new line is carriage return line feed. When you convert that to hex, percent OD, percent OA. Okay. So now what happens when you do a get request to this? Yeah? In fact, what is a get request? Actually, what is HTTP? Do you guys know? Do you people know, sorry? It's a protocol, that's right. It's a protocol. What does a protocol mean? Well, basically what it does is it's a protocol that sits on top of TCP. Okay, so you're making, you're opening up a TCP connection to this host, this port, a TCP low level connection. And then all you're doing to that is you're sending it strings. That's it. Strings that end in carriage return line feed. Now, something that's sitting on the other side, a HTTP server, just understands that if it gets a message, if it gets a port opening up, and it gets sent a line that ending in carriage return line feed, that's line one of the protocol. And it knows that when it gets two carriage return line feeds in a row, that's the end of the HTTP message. It's just a protocol. It's just simple, right? That's all the HTTP is. But the HTTP connection library that, that, that we're using, that, that, that there's, there's node libraries that do this as well. But there's just no great story with a node library. But there's, there's node libraries that do this as well. Can ret convert that ODOA to carriage return line feeds. But the thing is, what's going to happen here, right? So what we've basically done is we've taken a well-formed HTTP message and turned it into a malformed HTTP message. A HTTP server that's sitting on the other side just will go, oh, I don't know what this is. I thought it was a HTTP message. It's not. Throw back an error. So what's, so what's he done, basically? He's basically given the capability of doing a git push and then sending a HTTP message that's malformed. What are you going to do with that? Well, it depends. Well, what if you send HTTP get to this? Who can, who can name the process? 11211. No guesses? He got that. Memcache. Somebody from over here. Yeah, perfect. Memcache. Um, this is Memcache. Does Memcache use HTTP? No. Memcache is not HTTP. So what happens? Basically, that gets converted into this. Okay, and then remember what's happening again is that we're opening up a, ho a TCP connection to this host port, a TCP connection. When you're using a HTTP library, it opens up a TCP connection, a low-level TCP connection. Then it does this, it just sends it, the first line, ending in carriage return line feed. Now we've opened up to memcache, and memcache doesn't understand this. Memcache just goes, I don't know what this is. Malformed, I don't know, whatever, why are you sending me this? Then you send this to memcache, and it's like, I know what this is. Yep, this is my memcache protocol. I'm going to set data on key, and the rest of it is kind of timeout parameters. So memcache is like, great, I got this, thank you. Then you send it this, I don't know what this is. Why are you sending me this crazy stuff? What is this? I don't know. And that's what you're basically doing. This is called uh, protocol smuggling, okay? There is a memcache protocol, and within the HTTP protocol, we're smuggling the memcache protocol. So using a HTTP library, you can communicate with memcache. So who here uses, who here like directly uses, maybe does, does some node and directly uses memcache? Anybody? Not many. 
Well, trust me, a lot of your, a lot of what you're, if you're using a server side, and you probably are using a server side, right? Memcache is just a key component to any web architecture. You cannot write even a slightly performant website without using memcache to cache your database connections. And what you commonly do is when you read data from a database, you would do something like look aside caching, where you basically would um, take your code or your data, and then you'd basically store, serialize it to a string format, store it in memcache, to so keep it on memory, and then later on when you need the data, you load it from memcache into memory and you execute the code and you're happy. But Orange just showed you how to change what's in memcache. So now, you're happy as a developer, you take your object, you serialize it, you put it in memcache, you're really innocent, then later on you're like, I need that data again, you pull it from memcache, you deserialize it, you run it, and you execute your code. But you're not executing your code now. Now you're executing the code that Orange stuck in memcache. What, again, what can you do with this? Or when you're using some of these libraries that will automatically serialize kind of an instance or, a, or an instance of a class to, uh, to, to, to something that can be stored in memcache, sometimes it uses the name of the class as part of the key. And then in memcache, you can list the keys. So then by listing the keys in memcache, just having a look at what's being used, found this one deprecated instance variable proxy. Deprecated. So instance variable proxy had a known vulnerability. They figured there was a problem with it. So what they then did was they then added deprecated to it in the next release so that if you were to use it, you had to change all your code from instance variable proxy to new deprecated instance variable proxy. It's kind of, we do this, right, to kind of force developers to think about it for a second. Do you really want to use this class? It's got the word deprecated in front of it. Do you really want to use it? Um, but for whatever reason, I mean, we're all, we're all under pressure, right? We all have to do hit deadlines. So they used it. They used deprecated instance variable proxy. But it also means that then it's really clear to know what the vulnerability is, right? Because it's well known. And the vulnerability that depre instance variable proxy had is that you could change the class, the, the serialized representation in just a very specific way so just the act of deserialization, just the act of deserialization executed a command on the server. Just that act. And so the end kind of um, uh, a webhook URL is this. It's quite complicated. But the big thing, the, the full one is the first, uh, the first thing, the first webhook URL that gets posted to. And then you can see the URL, the kind of the middle one, why am I doing my hands? The middle one here, this is what will get, we'll have a get request. And then basically the actual darker bit here is what actually gets uh, serialized. And I don't think, I think hopefully you can see right in the center of the circle is the word ID. That is what gets executed on the server. So you can replace that ID with whatever command you want. And that's going to be what's executed on the server. So to prove that he should deserve the money, Orange made a video. I'll just show you it. So, it was GitHub Enterprise, by the way. I forgot to mention that. Let's go to Profile, Repo, uh, go to Settings, and you want to basically put the webhook URL in. Runs a command just to print out the URL, because it, you know, you, it's difficult to remember this stuff. Paste it in, hit save. Now to trigger this, um, this exploit, you just have to do a search, just a search, because that's gonna grab the data from memcache. And to actually make sure that you just run a command here so you can see what gets run on the server. So you can see now it's done the search, the ID command got run on the server. Hmm. Just a webhook URL. And now you can run a command on a server. So what's the story here? Um, I think the story here is that w big exploits 
are made from smaller exploits. So we always think, when we think about security, web security for applications, we always think that, ah, if there's a problem, it's going to be one giant hole in our security. It's going to be like really obvious. You know, Asim messed up and left something on the server running. You know, we think it's one big hole. But it's not. Right? It's quite subtle. Right? I think uh, hacking stories are always really fun because they quite often come at you from the side, by definition, because you usually have your shields up. Right? So the only way to get at you is through the side. Right? It's quite interesting stories. And quite often, you have to chain multiple different smaller exploits together. Right? I think there's only one issue here, which was GitHub's code. Everything else was other exploits from other systems plugged together. So you might kind of look at Angular uh, change logs and think, you know, and think, nah, I'm not going to bother updating. It's not a big issue. You know, do it. And if you find a small vulnerability in your code and you're thinking, oh, it's, it's probably not a big deal. No one's going to be able to come through that way. Fix it. That's the end of the first story. How's everybody doing? Anybody nervous at least? I don't think anybody needs a toilet just yet. No, you're all, you're all good right now. I think they build them quite tough in Viking land. I'm going to have to ramp it up a level to scare you guys, people. So next story, Equifax. Who heard of the Equifax hack last year? Hands up, a few people. So this is actually the largest hack in history. It affects about 200 million people's records. Um, Equifax, a billion dollar company, has about 10,000, yeah, 10,000 employees. But before I explain what happened here, let me again go through a couple more bits of terminology. So I mentioned exploit earlier on. Who's heard of zero day exploit? Okay, like a lot more. Not more. Almost as much as had peed themselves. Um, so a zero-day exploit is just an exploit that no one knows about yet. It's private. Okay, it's a secret. Um, but when, but once a vulnerability becomes known, becomes in the public domain, you stop calling it a zero-day exploit. It's just called an exploit. Okay, or a public domain exploit. You might even think about it like a one-month exploit or a six-month exploit. It's been in the public domain for a lot longer. So how hard do you think it would be to get a hold of a zero-day exploit? It's pretty hard, right? It's very hard. You can't just, there's no like eBay for exploits, right? or for zero-day exploits. You have to know the right people. You have to roll in the right circles. You have to be trusted. No one's just going to sell you a, an exploit that you could just post in the public uh, somewhere and de decrease the value of it. There was a study done two years ago, I think, now. Because no one knows. There's no like eBay, right? So you can't actually go through and get some stats and figure out how much a zero-day exploit costs. But they've kind of looked at this stuff tangentially, and they think that a good zero-day exploit goes for about $250,000. And you actually get paid in installments. So you get paid in installments as long as the exploit remains a secret. Because once it becomes public, the value goes down. Right? So how hard do you think it would, get, it would be to get hold of just an exploit that's been in the public domain for six months? It's really easy. It's very easy. You just have to Google it. There's loads of databases out there, loads of them. This is a, a one with a nice UI that I like to use called ExploitDB. So I'm just searching PHP in there, and I'm just scrolling down. This is all still in one year, right? And if you want to know more details about the exploits, you can just kind of click in uh, to anyone, and it will give you instructions, uh, details about the exploit, instructions for how to run it yourself and, and, uh, and attack yourself, right? There's loads of databases, this is just one of them. Pretty easy. But who here, like we're all developers here, right? So who here has spent an entire day writing a script to save themselves five minutes 
of manual labor, right? We do this all the time. So why do you think hackers wouldn't do the same thing? Of course they'd do it. There's loads and loads of automated hacking tools or tools that help you hack. This is one like famous one called Metasploit. Um, a lot of people use this. You can basically point it at a website uh, and it will scan it and detect what vulnerabilities this website might have. It then has plugins that you can install where you can even, you can, you can even attack automatically. There's a tool I saw the other day called Autosploit on GitHub, Autosploit, where it, it now can spider the web automatically finding vulnerable devices and automatically exploiting them. And it's quite useful because there's actually a, a database, there's actually a search engine now with all of the, the network linked cameras in the world and you can use these auto exploits to try and hack them all and get feeds from different places around the world, which is quite interesting. So, given that, did Equifax get hacked by a zero day exploit? No. They got hacked through a known vulnerability of a web framework called Apache Struts. A known vulnerability. That had been fixed for two months already. All they had to do to protect themselves was install an update. The largest hack in history could have been prevented by installing an update. No one wants to be that engineer explaining that to the CEO, right? And I know we're all laughing about this, but actually it's much, much more common than we think, right? Sneak, who, I don't know if you heard of me or not, they, they're a security firm that do a lot of stuff with, with Node. Um, they do a bunch of, uh, they had a report, they analyzed and said 12 of the top 50 data breaches were through known vulnerabilities. So 25% of all breaches were through known vulnerabilities. Not Mr. Hack, not Mr. Robot secretly hacking away your website with mad genius skills. No, 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 no. Somebody Googling how to hack. And in fact, if we they did another more recent study which showed that 77% of sites used vulnerable JavaScript libraries. And in fact, if you look at the Angular documentation, I thought this was really interesting, if you look at the Angular documentation for both Angular JS and Angular, the very, very, very first item in, in the security sections for both docs is keep current with the latest library releases. Keep current, use the latest Angular JS possible. Who here is using the latest Angular JS or Angular? The latest. Okay, 25% like of the audience, right? Oh, and like, who here, um, I talk about migration a lot as well, as, as Katrina says. I, I, I talk about migration a lot as well. Who here is using AngularJS still? Wow. Okay. So if you're trying to find a reason to convince your management to migrate from AngularJS to Angular, just say Equifax. Right? You want to migrate. You want to keep the latest versions possible. Although AngularJS is keeping updated with security patches, so don't worry about that too much. Um, FYI, I have an AngularJS migration course that's available on my website, codecraft.tv, that I've just launched recently. Um, so for the 25% of you, maybe you want to take a look at that. Um, oh, and also, if you're using GitHub to host your code, like a really cool feature they added not that long ago, actually, I think just a couple of months now, is if you look in your Insights tab on the dependency graph, They've now added uh, the ability, they basically scan your package JSON, they see the version numbers that you're using and then they will look at one of those databases and tell you you're using a vulnerable dependency, so go fix it. So if you go into GitHub and using a vulnerable dependency, it'll actually show you right at the top, in big warning to update this dependent package. And if, uh, you, if you want to kind of add these kind of checks to your build process, to your CI build process, there's a bunch of other tools as well. Sneak, obviously, but then you can also use NSP from Node Security. And then you can basically just run NSP check 
And it will kind of do, does a similar thing, but reports it in a command line tool so you can then use it in a build, build process. And it also does other things as well. It's like a linter for security. <clears throat> so to summarize, it's pretty easy to hack somebody through a known vulnerability. You just have to Google stuff, right? It's not hard. Um, and the evidence seems to suggest that a lot of us are using libraries with known vulnerabilities, right? So use tools like NSP, use GitHub dependency, but most importantly, keep stuff updated, right? Oh, and uh, there's a um, side note. So there's a OWASP is a, um, basically it's a, well, they have a top 10 list. It's a top 10 list of the top 10 most vulnerable ways of, uh, of attacking an application, right? So they'd recently updated it in 2017. The previous one was 2013. They've recently updated it. And I think it's quite interesting. The A8 is now insecure deserialization, which I covered in the, the first story. Uh, using a bunch of known vulnerabilities, well, that's, that existed before, it's still there now, that's what I just covered right now. Insufficient logging and monitoring, new. And one of the reasons I talk about security here is when I got hacked, but also in Azure, we've got like a really cool tool called the Azure Security Center. And it's built for people like me, who's not a security expert, who just want like a tool that you click that then lints and secures your application. Okay, so it's got that. But it's got one really cool feature that I love that is, because um, I've dealt with this before, like you get lots of little alerts that things are going wrong with your application. But if you get them as emails, you tend to ignore, ignore them, right? Because you get so many of them, just ignore them. So we noticed that as well. So what we did, so if every time you get an alert, if we emailed on it, people would just start ignoring it. So what we did eventually was we basically trained an AI. We trained an AI to lick, look at all of the alerts and, and, and signals in your application. And if it can find a path that it thinks is an attack, it will send you a big alert, right? It won't email you for the little ones. And what's really good about these kind of alerts is that when you look at it in the dashboard, it actually tells you, it's really interesting, it actually tells you how they got in. So you can trace it back all the way through your, your system. So pretty simple. I think it costs like $15 to set up. So, well, it costs you $15, it costs me nothing. So like, I like to set it up. How are we doing? Okay, I'm, I'm running a little bit over. I'm going to be very, very quick on the last one. So, what does this code do? No? Basically, grabs your environment variables and sticks them in a string. Okay? What does this code do? What's the rest of this do? It seems to then grab that data, stick it in some sort of post and post it to my server, codecraft.tv. Who here sticks connection strings, passwords, in the environment variables? Hopefully you do, like my, my, my boss just showed you how to do that in the last keynote, right? So that's what, you, who, who here sticks like sensitive stuff in the environment variables? A few people, okay. I think the people, the people who kept their hands down, you're probably hard coding stuff in your files and you probably shouldn't be doing that. But yeah, we keep sensitive stuff in our environment variables. So I'm now, what if I told you that I could make you run this code on your server? What if I could told you that you could, you would send your environment variables to me? Would you believe me? Huh? Okay, what about this? Well, the script is package setup JS. No? Maybe, you could tell what it is now. Now it's a node module. It's a setup script for a node module. So if you install this node module, you're going to send me your environment variables. I know what you're thinking. There, you're probably thinking, whatever, Asim. If I install your node module, I'd send you my environment variables. But I'm never going to install your node module, Asim. Come on. But who saw this? This was like last end of last year. There's a tweet. It appeared in my Twitter feed. It's a cross-env package, okay? So what I discovered was that someone had posted another cross-env package. Cross-env is the real one. Cross-env 
is the fake one. And the only difference between the two was a setup script. In the fake one, the setup script was sending the environment variables to the hacker's machine every time you run npm install. OK. And it's actually quite a common issue. It's called typo squatting. It's across different languages. Python's got it. A bunch of different languages have got it, right? And it's quite a common problem. And we all do it, right? We all do it. We all type npm install, and you're typing Angular hyphen CLI? Or is it CLI? Oh, it, it works. Fine. Good. I'm, I'm happy. I'll move on. Right? We all do it. But if you think about it, what are you doing when you type npm install? What are you doing? You're getting code from somebody else, somebody else you've probably never met in your entire life, and you're taking their code, and you're sticking it in your application, so it runs behind your firewall, behind every single security feature that you added. You're just doing it. You're doing it all the time. Can you think of a more easy way of doing an injection attack than that? Right? And I think this is the moral of the story, is that we're too trusting. And that, that when I found out about that, I was like literally took a step back and I was like, oh my God, what's going on? What, why, how, why am I so affected by this? And I realized after a while, it's because it's open source. Yeah? We implicitly trust code that's in open source. If I came to you and I said, hey, I've got this binary node module, native, right? The code is secret but it's twice as fast as cross them. Go use it. You wouldn't use it. You wouldn't trust it. But this was open source, so we like thought, oh, there will never be an exploit in some open source code, right, that we're using. Somebody's going to raise it. And actually, that cross them package was up for two weeks before it was discovered. cross them is downloaded, I, think, I can't remember, I should write this stat down. I think it's like a million times a week or something like that. It's a very, very low level library, right? So it's downloaded a lot. But what are the solutions? Well, some of the things you can do, well, if you're publishing packages to NPM, you can publish it under a private scope, and that means that you own the scope, and then only you can publish stuff under there, and this probably might explain one of the reasons why we see things as at Angular, right, these days. And something they've just introduced very, very recently in uh, NPM land is that now they've added a package moniker rule. So if there's already package underscore name, you now can't publish a package which changes only by punctuation. So you now can't just change, upload package name and package dot name. They've, they've, they've changed the rules. How's everybody feeling? Not so well. <laughs> oh, I broke through the, the Viking armor finally. Excellent. Um, so that's it. Thank you. I want, what I'm going to just to summarize what's the takeaway? Okay. Um, don't be an Equifax. Update. Do it all the time. If anybody argues, make sure, just give them that, 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 that example. There's no such thing as a small vulnerability. Okay, don't ignore them. You know, fix them. Be very, very, very paranoid. Hopefully I showed you the subtle ways you can get in. Be very paranoid. It's not going to be so obvious. And did the last one scare anybody? The NPM one. Yeah? Scared me. So don't trust anyone. And I, I don't have a solution for that, so it's just a unicorn. So uh, yeah, thank you very much for your time. Um, if you, again, if you follow me on, on Twitter, I'll wait. Can... Okay, fine. If you follow me on Twitter, I'll be posting up the slides later on. And thank you very much for your time. Cheers.